Amen. It was a crowded marketplace in Israel. Beautiful day. And we had been, the Bee Creek group had been eating at hotel buffets for about a week. And so when they cut us loose for real food, we were over the moon. And we saw these different stands, and our guide said, you can go wherever you want and get some food. And we saw these little umbrella tables that were set out, and we were going to go sit and eat at those umbrella tables. So some of us went to get gyros, and some of us were really digging the falafel, and there was even a burger stand. Um, there was a little ice cream shop. Some people just wanted a sweet treat, because those were rare, actually, ice cream and sweets. And so everybody's gathering back up together at these little umbrella tables. And... As we're going to sit down, some of us had sat down, some of us still working on it, we started hearing someone yelling in Hebrew, loud, angry, yelling. But you always look, right? We didn't know what was going on, what, what, if it was bad, what, who was responsible, and then it switched to English. And the ice cream shop owner was running out of the store yelling one word in English over and over, no, 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 no. And I look over and that man is running straight at four people from Bee Creek United Methodist Church. Four people going to sit in the little umbrella stand by the ice cream shop. And I remember it was somebody who had a burger and I think it might have been Richard Jensen who has moved on me. So I think he's over there. I think it was Richard had a hamburger and whoever it was, that man the ice cream shop owner went right up to that person from our group and was like, no, no, no. And poor Richard with his burgers like, what am I doing wrong here? You know, I mean, I know I didn't buy it at your ice cream stand. I'm sorry, but there's four, there's three other people who did. And right then the guide, our guide Hanania, who was amazing, he sees what's going on and he intercepts the ice cream shop owner and is talking in Hebrew really fast and calming him down and getting him to go back to a store and telling poor Richard and his hamburger, if you just go stand over here, it will be okay. Okay, just over here. And he comes back and he, he says to Richard with the hamburger, you could sit with this other group. And then he says, let me explain to you what just happened. He said, for all Jewish people, all Jewish people know that there is an invisible, not just a line, but a wall right here between the dairy ice cream area of this marketplace and the meat gyro hamburger area of this marketplace. And, and there are no signs, and there isn't a wall or a door that says no dairy beyond this point. Just if you're Jewish, you know that you can't take your hamburger into the ice cream shop. Because, not because they're, they say, well, you didn't buy that here, but because by taking that hamburger into the ice cream shop area, if Richard would have sat down and he and that hamburger would have touched anything in that area. The entire, not just the table, but the entire area would be unclean. The man would have to close his shop for the day and perform purification rituals. It would be the morning before he could open again. Israel, going to Israel and being in Israel really opened up our understanding of the, the background of our faith. And we got to learn things about the kosher laws. And so some of these might be things that you know and some not. But um, if you're a Jewish, then the way that you eat food and what you eat is an act of faith. And it sets you apart from the rest of the world. So it's, it says, I follow God and so I'm eating differently. So you can only eat a certain kind of animal. And the Bible spells it out. Just read in the Old Testament. You can get a guide to what animals are okay and what are not. There's certain kinds of fish that are okay and certain that are not. There's certain kind of birds that are okay, and then there's others that are unclean. You cannot eat them if you're faithful. And then the mammals, m many of y'all will know that they have to have a cloven hoof and chew the cud. Okay, so pigs are out because they don't chew the cud. But cows and sheep and goats are okay. Now, once you have narrowed down the field to these are the kosher, acceptable, clean animals, then they have to be slaughtered in a particular way. If they're not, then they become unclean. You can't eat them. So they have to be killed in a certain way. Um, if you're getting a, a milk product or an egg from a chicken, that has to come from a kosher animal that's eating kosher food. Okay, so the cow has to be eating kosher food. And that's, that matters because grains can be kosher or not. You can't 
You cannot eat grain that has been planted in a field that's a new crop of grain. It has to have been like the second or the third year that grain has been in that field. You can't eat fruit that's from a tree that's less than three years old. It's not kosher. If there's a mixed planting of grain, like if you have two different kinds of grain, you have a field, you're like, okay, well, this will be over here and this will be over here. You can't do that. The Bible, the Old Testament says no. They have to be separate from each other. No mixed plantings or it's not kosher. It's complicated, right? And one of the kosher laws in, that comes from Leviticus is you cannot mix meat and milk. There is no cheeseburger, okay? McDonald's does not serve it because it's not kosher. And so to take the meat into the dairy area isn't kosher. In fact, there, many Jewish people will, if they drink a glass of milk in the morning, they begin to count the hours until they reach six before they can consume any meat. Because what if they touched in the stomach? God said no. So that's kind of foreign to us who are used to just, I like that food, I'm going to eat it. I don't like that food, I'm not going to eat it. But you can imagine being part of a community where for generations, part of your obedience to God, your devotion to God has been to follow these very strict laws about what you eat. And because you eat this way, you are showing your faith and love to God, and you are also providing a witness to the world that the way I do things is different because of my love for God. And that's the way it was for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years. Je Jesus was a Jewish man who kept kosher. Now, there are some notable exceptions, right? Like when the disciples pick grain on the Sabbath and everybody goes, <gasps> That's not right. You know, it's the seeds of things that are to come. But even when Easter Sunday comes and Jesus is alive and death is destroyed and sin, ha its back is broken and we are set free, nobody who was a believer at that time, none of Jesus' followers said, well, forget all this kosher stuff. No, that's the way you were faithful to God. So the Messiah has come and we're just gonna keep on going, eating the way we always have because it's in the Bible that God says he expects this of us. So all of the first early believers are Jewish believers and they're eating kosher foods. And if you wanna be a follower of Jesus, you need to start eating kosher until the day of Peter's vision on the roof. So we, we hear that it comes noon and Peter is starving. Have you ever been there? You're starving. Somebody was in charge of the meal. They're late. They, they got distracted. They got a late start. The food isn't ready. Now I can see Peter in this moment just going down to the kitchen and watching or saying, you know what we all need is a little homily on punctuality and responsibility, we've each got our job. But no, he does that, he goes up to the roof and he says, I'm gonna use this time, my stomach's rumbling, I'm gonna pray. So he begins to pray and God gives him this vision. Peter sees this sheet coming down from heaven and he can tell it's filled with food. And his stomach is rumbling, hopefully this is, God performs miracles and Peter is thinking, this is the miracle of God that I am hungry and food is being provided and it's all bunched up and then the four corners of the sheet start to unfold to reveal the feast and <gasps> revolting. I mean, there's a pig in there, there are clams and oysters and shrimp and lobster <sighs> who would ever think of eating a lobster? So Peter is backing up when the voice of God says, get up, kill and eat. And Peter says, because he's Peter, oh, heck no. You said not to eat all of this junk and I never have and I never will. The, the Bible tells me so. And God says, I am declaring all food to be clean food. And the sheet is pulled up to heaven and Peter is left going, what just happened? I mean, for generations this is what we've been doing and this is what is written in our scriptures and did I just hear that right? Is it just because I'm hungry? Am I making this up? 
how will I ever teach this to the church if this really is God's word? And right as he, I'm sure all these things are swirling through his head, the sheet comes down again. And it's filled with the same animals, and God says the same thing, and Peter says no again, and God says, yes, all food is clean food. The sheet goes up. And Peter's still there thinking, can this be real? Can this be, can this be real? And it comes down again, and the same thing happens again. And I, I hope you understand what a pivotal moment this is in our faith history. Because for thousands of years, faith has been expressed in one certain specific way. And it's in the Bible. And God is saying it's time to change. It's time to change for the people who have been here from the start. Not to ask those people outside to change and start eating like this, but to let this go that all, God says all food is clean for you now. And now you can go out into the world and you can meet all kinds of people you could never even be with before. And you can tell them about me if you, if you just listen to me and eat that lobster. Now one of those people is a man named Cornelius. He was a Gentile. He was not a Jewish believer. He's a Gentile like you and me. He was faithful. He prayed. He was generous with what he had. He was righteous. If, if you came to him for help, he would do what he could to help you. He was, he was a Roman, right? A Roman leader who's believing in God. And yet, he didn't eat kosher food. He enjoyed lobster and shrimp and all of that revolting stuff, right? Bacon, ugh. And because of what he ate, he was unclean. So he could never go to worship in the temple. He had to stand outside. He could never take the hands of Jewish believers and pray with them because if he touched them, they would be unclean. He could never go into the home of another Jewish, of a Jewish believer and talk because his presence in that house would make it unclean and they'd have to do purification rituals. No Jewish believers could ever come visit him and talk to, to him about his faith and their shared love of God. He was an out, outcast and an outsider. And he is praying to God. And God interrupts his prayer and says, I need you to go look for a man named Peter. And he's staying in the city down the road called Joppa. It was over a day's journey. He said, go, go right now. You'll find him at this house in this city, Joppa. And Cornelius calls two servants in his household. He calls a devout soldier. Whoa. He's had an influence on the soldiers. And he says, you need to go look in Joppa for this man named Peter and tell him about this vision from God and see if he'll come. He probably won't. He's Jewish. And so the messenger set out. And did you notice when they arrive? Right as the sheet is being lifted up to heaven for the third time, they reach the house and they stand at the gate and they knock. Now that's important that they're standing at the gate, isn't it? Because they're not allowed inside that house. If they, if they walk into the house, they know they're making the whole space unclean and so they, they're outsiders and they're at a Jewish home and they're standing at the gate so that they don't contaminate the place. And Peter comes to the gate to meet them and say, you, you asked for me? And they tell him about this vision that God gave to Cornelius and how he's a God-fearing man and he loves the Lord, but he's a Gentile. And God said that Peter might come with them. And they just happened to get here at just this time, right? That's not a coincidence. So Peter is seeing now, not only has he had this vision, but God has immediately sent confirmation. And he takes the first step on this really scary path of change. He um, opens the door and invites the Gentiles into the house. And the Bible says they eat a meal together. That was the first ever meal that Jewish people shared with Gentiles. Jewish and Gentile believers, the first ever meal. And then he says, why don't you sleep here tonight in this house under this roof? And the next day he goes with them and he enters a Gentile home, talks to the people there, sees their faith, tells them about Jesus the Messiah, and sees that the Holy Spirit 
is inhabiting their hearts. You can see it. And Peter says, that's God's Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that I've seen in the hearts and the lives of Jewish believers is now in these Gentiles that for my whole life I've considered unclean. But God doesn't. And so that's where Peter changes. That's his third confirmation. There was a vision, there's a people at the gate, and then seeing the Holy Spirit at work in these people he's always thought were unclean and outsiders, he changes. Now I want, I want you to think about the depth of this change. God is not asking Peter to be okay sitting next to a Gentile eating bacon. He's not asking him to live and let live and I'll keep kosher and you, you do that. He's saying, Peter, eat the bacon. Peter, you change. You and all the Jewish believers who have been with me from the beginning, you're the ones who need to change to reach the rest of the world with my love. And so the burden for changing isn't placed on the outsiders, it's placed on the ones who got there first. You know, Jesus did say the last would be first and the first would be last, right? And we are here because those first disciples had the courage to completely change the way they had always worshiped God for the sake of those who aren't here yet. That's us. And on down through the ages in the church, there have been times of radical change. I mean, there was times when people thought that the only way to listen to the word of God was in Latin. And it was a huge discussion, argument about putting the word of God, reading scripture in something as vulgar as English. King James English. Vulgarity, right? That was a huge fight, but eventually the people saw we, that's the way that we communicate God's word. We don't make you learn Latin. We put the Bible in your language. And there were times when the Wesleys are trying to meet, meet with people, minister to coal miners who aren't welcome in churches and they don't know the church songs and so they start converting bar tunes. Hey, here's a song you sing at a bar when you're drinking. Let's sing it about God. And don't you know all the Anglicans at that day were saying, that is vulgarity. And those are some of our most beloved hymns now, aren't they? The old standbys of the church. Now you guys, at Bee Creek, um, I, this is not in preparation for any great change I see coming, right? I don't, oh, I don't know. This is one of the strange foods and what does it have to teach us? Um, we right now as a young church are used to being on the leading edge of change. We're used to being the ones whose uh, bacon is, is causing other church people to go, oh my gosh, they're eating bacon over there. They're worshiping in a distillery. Can that be holy? I mean, I'm asked that question all the time. I'm like, yes, because there's a whole other group of people who are coming to know Wall's worship who wouldn't come here. So yes, God is part of that. And yes, lives are being changed. And we talk about taking ashes to Highway 71 for Ash Wednesday, right? Like ashes to go, I will pray for you as you drive your car through. I will bless you and put the ashes on your forehead. And people say, is that holy? Heck yes it is. People are smiling and waving at us. Like who are those pastors on the side of the road? We need to be the church on the side of the road because that's where the people are that God wants to reach. And, and we get that right now, right? We're young, we get that, we're right there, we're leading the change. I believe, maybe not, but I believe there will come a day when we're older and we're happy with the way we've always done things. It feels good, it, it feels comfortable. We, we see things from a certain point of view and we don't really wanna change. And maybe, I'm trying to imagine what will happen, but maybe someday somebody's gonna come to me, some young whippersnapper, and say, you know what's really touching uh, musically the lives and the hearts of the, this next generation? Um, they're really, it's their soul music is the kazoo. And, and so, you know, maybe Gustavo doesn't need to play for us anymore, and Jim could learn how to play the kazoo, and I bet Steve could rock that. And let's just do kazoo worship. And on that day, I know I'm gonna say, you know what would be fine is if we had, you could have the sunrise room 
and we'll do, you can do kazoo worship in there, but we're going to keep doing real worship in here. And I hope on that day, God finds all of us praying and lowers into our midst a big sheet filled with kazoos and says, you better start learning how to play this thing. And I hope on that day, Bee Creek, that all of us say, this is the most disgusting, awful thing I've ever thought of in worship. But if this is really touching the heart of this next generation, and I learn how to play this thing, and they, know how, they learn how to love you because I do it, then we pick up the kazoo and we start playing it. And it's the most holy, ungodly sound anyone's ever heard. And the, gen the, new, the next generation comes to know Christ, right? Because that's our calling. Our calling as God's people is to be the ones who are ready to change for the sake of those who aren't here yet. Not change in our love of God. Not change in the, in, the, in the grounding, foundational tenets of the faith, but change in how we practice it. If it means somebody else can come to know Jesus. And I'll never forget, uh, when I was a young pastor, I first church I've ever served uh, was First Church San Angelo. They were a big steeple church, stained glass windows. Um, they got me a new robe because mine wasn't good enough. And I, with the rest of the pastors, I would process in. So during the first song, everybody would stand up and everyone was in a suit and a tie and the women were in heels and hose and everybody looked perfect and they would stand up and we would come in from the back in our robes, carrying our Bibles, trying not to trip and the choir would follow us and we'd go right up to the front and it was so traditional that the choir wasn't facing the congregation, they were facing each other, old school. And we do the whole, the whole liturgy was printed in the bulletin. It was broadcast on the rock and roll station every Sunday morning. They would stop rock and roll and they'd broadcast our church. And in that first year, um, I got the feeling that God wanted us to start a new idea at the church, a new worship service. And they let me. And so I would change out of my robe and stole and um, I'd pull on some jeans and set up my heels and my dress and I'd run over to the fellowship hall where there was a band warming up and we opened a side door so you didn't have to walk through the whole big church. You could just come in from the side parking lot and we wheeled out a, a coffee pumper where you could put flavors in your coffee. It was good coffee. And we had um, couches and tables and chairs instead of pews or even seats. And everybody who was in Sunday school at that hour said we were too loud. They said that. And then many people at meetings said, so I hear you're getting, you know, new people there. When will they come to real church? I got a lot of that. And there was this one lady who um, volunteered, began to volunteer about the first month that it was happening. <laughs> Franny was volunteering. And she would come over, she would come over from big church, um, over to the Celebration Hall worship service. And she'd stand at the door and she'd give out the study guide. And I saw her do that one week and I, I saw that she had these orange earplugs and her sticking out of her ears. I thought, I need to have a conversation with Franny and just see where her heart is in this, right? And so the next Sunday before worship, I, I said, Franny, you know, I, I'm so excited you're here. Uh, tell me what made you want to volunteer here, be an usher, you know, what, what led you to this? And she said, well, first of all, let me tell you what I don't like about this, okay? She said, this band is too loud. She said, it's just, that's why I'm wearing these earplugs, Pastor Laura, it's just too loud. She said, I don't like this music at all. It doesn't speak to me at all. I am a hymn person. I was like, oh dear Lord, I'm gonna have to get rid of Franny. Like, what could she do? And then she said, but. She said, Pastor Laura, I look at these kids. She said, look at all these kids. She said, look at these young families. They would never come to my worship service. So I'm here because I want to help God do this new thing in our church. I can promise you that the Apostle Peter, and I know it, it sounds crazy, but I promise you he never liked bacon double cheeseburgers. <sighs> but he ate them. Or something like it. Something unkosher. He ate that way so that he could sit next to an outsider and tell them about the family of God. He ate that way because God called him to change. 
and he gave God his willing heart. And he ate that way so that he could help God do the new thing God was doing. Could we do that? Will we do that? Let's pray. God, we know that you don't call us to stay exactly the way we are, that you are calling us to change and to be transformed. And sometimes it's for the sake of those who haven't heard yet. And sometimes it's really hard. And so I pray, Lord, when it's time for us to change or to try something new or to do something uncomfortable, that you would, like you did with Peter, speak that word in multiple ways. Help us to be listening, to be seeing the way you're moving, to look for your Holy Spirit in unexpected places and unexpected people. And help us not to cross our arms and say, heck no, I'm not gonna do that. But even when we're afraid to step forward and say, yes, Lord, let me help you with this new thing you're doing. We ask this in our Savior's name, amen. Let's stand up and sing our closing song. Mm -hmm.